Hello, my name is Thomas Linton, and this is a lecture for um, Christian Worldview on existentialism and the meaning of life, or existentialism and, um, and the Christian Worldview. This is essentially a internal critique in, of the implications of existentialism as a world. So we see here on this map that there's an arrow pointing and it says you are here for no apparent reason. This is implications of, of what existentialism is as a worldview. Now you notice there's all these different paths. That also is imperative of existentialism because existentialism does believe that we arrive on the scene, scene with no, uh, for no apparent reason, but we then determine our outcome in life. So let's continue on. So we see here the five main themes of existentialism. And this is provided from uh, a book by Thomas Flynn called Existentialism, A Very Short Introduction. So within the five basic uh, themes of existentialism, we see existentialism precedes, um, existence precedes essence, time is of the essence, humanism, which is it's person-centered, uh, freedom or resp and responsibility, and uh, ethical considerations are paramount. So let's examine theme one. So here we see theme one says, Existence precedes essence. Now, what you are, your essence is a result of your choices, your existence rather than the reverse. Essence is not destiny. What you are is what you make yourself to be. There is no predetermined pattern of life. The idea of that no general, non formal account of what it means to be human can be given. There is no predetermined case of what humanity is prior to the case, since that meaning is decided in and through existing itself. Now, the Christian worldview differs from this, because the Christian worldview says that we are image of God. And so right there, we see a difference. So we come to theme number two. The second theme of existentialism is time is of the essence. We are fundamentally time-bound beings. Now, what this means is that we live a certain amount of time in this life, and we have to be present in this life. We give value and meaning to the choices we make. And you'll see that what this means later, the, impa the implications of this in the existentialist worldview. So we see theme number three, existentialism is a humanism. So existentialism is fundamentally a person-centered philosophy. It's a philosophy of life that's person-centered, meaning it's centered around each individual. That also means it's arbitrary. There's a lot of arbitrariness in it. So not anti-science. It means it's not, not trying to go against the current findings in science. Existentialism focuses on the individual's focus on uh, the pursuit of identity and meaning amidst social and economic pressures of mass society for superficiality and conformity. So it really is trying to go against the grain of society. You think of the kind of the punk rocker who, who rebels against uh, the mainstream of, of what current rock and roll is that that is that is an example of existentialism in practice and it also seen in our current society um before it became mainstream the L lgbtq community could have been considered in this this um in this existentialist focus of human identity um in a way you know we all choose our, who we are right so that's very existentialist but it's gone a little bit off the existentialist view because now it essentially it's becoming more mainstream. So, and it's and it's expecting conformity. So that right there goes against a little bit of what existentialism would say. Theme number four 
is freedom and responsibility. Existentialism is a philosophy of freedom. Its basis is the fact that we can stand back from our lives and reflect on what we have been doing. In this sense, we are always more than ourselves. So we can reflect and analyze what our life is like and change it if we want. Theme five, eth ethical considerations are paramount. Though each existentialist understands the ethical as with freedom and in his or her own way, that means it's very arbitrary and person-centered, the underlying concern is to invite us to examine the authenticity of our own lives and our society. So we're trying to live an authentic life. We're trying to be authentically the individual that we are. So we're not making our choices based upon trying to fit in with a crowd. We're trying to fit in with society. We're trying to do it to fit in with who we say we are. Now, there could be benefits to this, and obviously there's going to be drawbacks. The benefit is that, you know, if the, if the mainstream society is telling us to do things that we know are immoral, then we are bucking the system and doing what's right. But the problem is, what does authenticity look like? It looks different for each person. And then we'll look at that later. We'll look a little bit more later what that, that could look like. So we're going to look at some key existentialists of religious backgrounds and secular or um, uh, atheistic backgrounds. So first, uh, get this. Okay. So, but first, I want to show this this quick meme. It says it's a miserable life. It's a play on it's a um, wonderful life. And it has Arthur Schopenhauer, Friedrich Nietzsche, Jean Paul Sartre, and uh, Slavoj Zizek. And this is uh, Christmas is dead and we killed it. And it's just kind of a play on it. It's kind of the idea of we'll get to Nietzsche, Nietzsche singing that God is dead. But let's go to the secular and religious existentialist. So, okay. So the religious existentialist, Søren Kierkegaard, he's considered um, unorthodox in his theological approach and existential in his philosophy. Gabriel Marcel, and then Paul Tillich. And then we see the secular ones, Frederick Nietzsche, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Albert Camus. And this is there's more than this, but these are examples of, of religious and secular. So it's not just, there are religious-minded um, existentialists. So it's not solely an atheistic one, but I will say here that it is, uh, existentialism, I think, is more consistent with, with an atheism than it is theism. Okay, so this is a quote from Kierkegaard, and this is where I was, uh, this is going to be an important one because it's Kierkegaard's religious stage. And the quote says uh, about Kierkegaard by Thomas Flanagan, Existentialism, a short introduction, it says, in Kierkegaard's view, the leap of faith constitutes entrance into the religious sphere and the highest form of individuation. Here, the, operative, the operative categories are neither pleasure and pain, as in the aesthetic sphere, nor good and evil, as in the ethical, but sin and grace. The model is Abraham, who, in his story of Genesis, was ready to sacrifice his only son in obedience to God's command. Notwithstanding the divine promise, the old man would be the father of many nations. The categories of the ethical are suspended in response to a div divine command addressed to Abraham alone. The religious individual is, therefore, beyond good and evil. And this is important to understand because this is making the religious stage very person-centered, very individual basis. So it goes against kind of the Christian notion of revelation in the Word of God and scriptures. We see here a religious stage that's personal revelation, not uh, objective revelation in the scriptures. So existentialism is a humanism. Let's look at the contrast here. The contrast then is that, let's see if I can find a place to put me. That won't be in the way. Okay. Well, this will be good, I guess. Let's move myself up here in the corner. Okay. So, in arguing that existentialism is a humanistic philosophy, Sartre means 
that it places the human being at the center of its attention and at the apex of the moral value hierarchy. Though, the, though he mentions theistic existentialism, existentialists in his lecture, citing Jaspers and Marcel as examples, it is difficult to find room for them in the body of his speech. Rather, he insists that the ultimate value, the goal of our endeavors, should be the fostering of freedom and of individual, of the individual, by which he means the enhancement of his or her concrete possibilities of choices. Of choice. The creative freedom, he implies, should not be sacrificed to any higher value, whether it be the class of the Marxists or the god of religion. So again, you know, this, but this does not necessarily go against what Kierkegaard said, because Kierkegaard was making it highly individual as well. So it's just a matter of a god that's over all. You can have your own personal god as long as it's not a god that dictates on other people. So... Okay, so here, this is the quote from Nietzsche I was talking about. God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. Yet, his shadow still looms. How shall we com comfort ourselves, the murderer of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all, what the world has yet owned, was bl has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe the blood off us? What water is there to clean ourselves? And again, this is the idea that that now that we've uh, killed God, now we have to create something in place of God. And how are we going to do that? This is a funny little meme. Uh, like this is uh, Snoopy from Charlie Brown, and he says, "Where am Where am I going? What am I doing?" What is the meaning of life? And that's one of the things we're talking about today. What is the meaning of life? For the existentialism, it is what you make it up to be. So, again, this is this is um, Thomas J.J. Altsizer from the New Gospel of Christian Atheism. So, you can see Christian Atheism is a existentialist philosophy. With the full and final actualization of the ultimate death, all innocence disappears. Every possible historical return is ended. Transcendence does not simply vanish, but becomes ultimately alien. And a new total nothingness is everywhere. For the death of God is inseparable from the advent of a new, truly new, and even total nihilism. A truly new desert and abyss. A nihilism that Nietzsche knows as a consequence of Christianity and consequence of the uniquely Christian God, that God who alone has made possible and necessary our ultimate abyss. So again, the words of Nietzsche about the death of God, and this is, is playing off of the, the nihilism that results. Nihilism is essentially life is meaningless, and that's the crux of where the foundation by which existentialism is building off of. Existentialism is we arrive at the scene to nothingness, and we have to build something from it. We have to make our own existence. And that's why it's more consistent with atheism than theism. So another meme, and this says, hand over the money or I'll explain the absurdity of all human activity an existential threat, and it kind of shows the French philosopher there smoking a cigarette, um, quintessential French existentialist. So let's move on. So how do we properly define existentialism? So this is a, according to David Barash, and it's evolutionary existentialism, uh, social biology, and the meaning of life. Human beings define themselves give themselves meaning, and establish essence only via their existence. And human beings have no essence independent of the existence and specifics of how they choose to live. We live in a huge universe that is devoid of purpose and uncaring about people. We give meaning to our life by the free, conscious, and deliberate choices that we make. And this is important to understand. This is a comparative, and this is a complete um, attack on the Christian worldview, essentially. This is the complete opposite of what the Christian worldview says. If anything, this is a, a, 
a statement that is consistent with what happened in the garden with the rebellion. We want to choose right and wrong. We want to be gods to ourselves. And this is the consequence of when we choose to be gods into ourselves. So this is a quote from uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. It says, what is meant here by saying that existence precedes essence? It means, first of all, man exists, turns up, appears on the scene, and only afterwards defines himself. If man, as the existentialist conceives him, is indefinable, it is because at first he is nothing. Only afterwards will he be something, and he himself will have made what he will be. So we determine right and wrong, we determine who we will be. So we see here, let's see, here, here. Okay, man is condemned to be free because once thrown into the world, he is responsible for everything he does. It is up to you to give life a meaning. Another quote, better to die on one's knee, feet than to uh, live on one's knees. And another quote, freedom is what we do with what is done to us. Okay, and this is a meme. Time is of the essence. It says the meaning of life is to give life a meaning. Okay, another funny meme it says, "Dad and if his kid. Dad comes. Uh, the kid comes in. Dad, my existential angst is suffocating my ability to enjoy my existence." The the dad reads some Kierkegaard, but I'm only four. The dad's response: Then read Nietzsche. So let's move me down here. So ethical considerations. And this is where we get to um, the good faith versus bad faith. And the choice of authenticity appears to be a moral decision is what Jean-Paul Paul Sartre said. So we'll, let's examine that a little bit. Let's flesh that out. Okay. What is the Sartrean notion of bad faith? Then let's start with that. It is a widespread notion of self-deception. It is the notion of neglecting our openness to being, and instead to go with the flow. It is to live inauthentically as, quote, unquote, they do. That means the rest of society, even our friends or family. So, Sartian notion has two types of bad faith. The first type is found in a, a deterministic worldview, deterministic view, either in, we can see that in, in Freudian psychology or Marxist economic theory. They re revile uh, they uh, relieve us of the anguish of our freedom being for ourselves or conforming to social norms so it's either of those two really when it comes to this is is you know when it comes to a, a society that is going down communism well they're going to expect conformity and that does go against the existentialist view of we have to choose our own destiny so that's the first type of bad faith you know you can see marxism would be one uh, Freudian psychology would be the other. Okay, so let's look at the other type. The other type, second type of bad faith is is discount what he calls what Sartre calls discounting the antecedent condition. Now, what does this mean? That's that's a pretty deep word. Essentially, what that is 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 um, living as a quintessential daydreamer, living uh, not in reality, always living in your mind, in your thoughts, in your dreams, and not really living in uh, what's going on around you. So this is seen in uh, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. If you've ever seen this movie, Walter Mitty is this guy, he, he always lives in his head. He's always daydreaming. This right here is an example. He's, he's not really on this mountain. He's just daydreaming of it, and he's, life is passing him by. So that's considered bad faith, because life is pass making any choices of significance in his life. He's letting life just pass him by and he's living in a daydream in various daydreams. So what then what is it according to Sartre to live in good faith? Good faith is to be authentic. We have to be authentic to who we are. The realization of what it means to be, to exist, experiencing our contingency. Resolution to live, quote unquote, live by being unto death. So it's under, understanding that we're here, we have one life to live, we're going to die, we we need to make the best of it. And we're the ones that do that. 
So let's move on to this idea of uh, sociobiology and existentialism. I had a quote earlier from a, uh, about existentialism and sociobiology, but I want to kind of flesh that out a little bit more and kind of, kind of um, uh, explain a little bit more. So according to sociobiological or evolutionary model, our sole purpose is to pass on our gene, pass on our gene. So our sole purpose in life is to pass on the genes we have. Um, other than passing on one's own genes, there is no meaning slash purpose, and there's no right and wrong. There's just blind, pitiless indifference. And that's a, um, a quote from the just, the blind, pitiless indifference is uh, Richard Dawkins is famous for saying that. Existentialist philosophers like Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Sartre, Albert Camus encourage people to rebel in their personal lives. In fact, to follow the biological instincts an evolutionary model is what Sartre would call bad faith. So it's living, going with the flow. It's going with what our, you know, we can rebel against that and choose not to. And in a way, this is happening in our society. You have a lot of people instead of, a lot of couples instead of having children are getting two dogs instead. And let's have fur babies instead of actual children, our own ch children, instead of passing on our genes. And that really is a rebellion against our what would be considered an evolutionary worldview, our purpose from that perspective. So I thought that was important to see that there is a difference there. So let's continue this evolutionary existentialism. Let us grant, if only for argument's sake, that human beings, like other living things, are merely survival machines. So let's just give this, go with argument's sake. Let's give give them the benefit of the doubt that it's, that's what we are. For their, So we are survival machines for our genes, for their genes. Robots, whose mandated purpose is neither more or less than the promulgation, the, promulgation of those genes. If so, then there's no more inherent meaning to life as seen in the evolutionary terms than viewed by the existentialism. So essentially, the existentialism uh, and has no be more bearing, more or less bearing on what is considered meaning in life than evolutionary model. Neither one of them can really give you in any ultimate meaning to our life. And that's important to understand because Christianity does give us ultimate meaning. Our ultimate meaning is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's move on. So I want to give you kind of a real life example. So this is, uh, I believe, Nano is her name, 20 year old who believes she's a cat. So Nano's living in good faith because she's living out her catness. And how, so the question, therefore, that I want to ask the class is, how can a 20-year-old human who believes she is the wrong species exist in good faith? Well, what about family or society? Well, according to existentialism, she should not consider what her family or society believe. What about essence of, of humanity? Remember, existence precedes essence. So her choosing to be a cat and living in that cat likeness is actually living in good faith. Who is anybody to tell Nano that she's wrong? So let's let's flesh this out. Let's try to move this around. Okay, well, I'll discuss what we don't here. Okay, so I want to give a worldview analysis of existentialism. Now, I said earlier that existentialism is arbitrary and person-centered. So it's not, there's not a specific this is what all existentialists believe. And there's not a worldview, like this is what the worldview of existentialism holds to because it's all arbitrary and person-centered. But for the existentialism, then therefore, the ultimate reality is whatever the individual wants it to be because there is no objective ultimate reality. There's no objective ultimate reality. So whatever you want to make reality out to be, you can do so. Um, there is no specific nature of the universe for existentialism. It is what we want to make it out to be. So our, our nature, the nature of the universe, we can believe in evolutionary model. We can believe in, um, you know, um, religious existentialists. You know, we can believe God has something to do with it. But ultimately, we it's very person-centered. So it's not an objective uh, reality, an objective nature to the universe. Existentialism does not have a particular belief about the afterlife because this life is what we are living for. So we're living for this life, not the afterlife. Existentialism believe we are to live in good faith and not uh, go with the flow and not or be a daydreamer. So we don't want to be a daydreamer. So the, the only real ethical consideration there is we're not to con conform 
to what others want us to live like, and we're not to be a daydreamer and just let life pass us by. So according to, to existentialism, we ultimately, well, not ultimately, we determine our purpose because there's no ultimate meaning. Um, we, so we have to do the best we can to, to make meaning out of non-meaning. So internal critique of existentialism. Existentialism is a philosophy of life that attempts to make sense of our existence absent of ultimate reality and meaning. A life devoid of ultimate meaning cannot pass the coherence, correspondence, and practical worldview test. It just cannot. I mean, it just it's not going to. It's nothing to nothing about it that is coherent, because you know what to say that you know the person that's that's doing good and working for a really good nonprofit doing really good things for society is any better than the serial killer who thinks killing his neighbor is better than helping his neighbor. There's really nothing that is that makes one better than the other. So the Christian worldview is really the only alternative to um to 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 present. There's no real other alternative to to present. So the Christian worldview provides ultimate reality in the Trinity Trinitarian God. And then the redemption through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So we have our, our, our redemption through Jesus Christ. And uh, today, Sunday, it was um, considered it was, it was Palm Sunday, and we, we I did, went with through my with my children um, some of the scripture relating to Jesus showing up with, with me and uh, the people putting down the palm leaves and worshiping them, and then the 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 prophecy from um, Zechariah about that. And how that the word of God, you know, the word of God testifies to Jesus. So the Christian worldview provides us with our meaning by humanity being the image bearer of God. So we don't provide our own meaning. God does for us. And God says we're his image. And that means we have ultimate value. Uh, the Christian worldview provides us with the ultimate sense of justice. So in existentialism, there is no ultimate justice for the Hitlers of the world. There's no ultimate justice for the serial killers of the world. There's no ultimate justice for the rapist. Um, ultimately, you know, there is no ultimate ultimate justice. God provides, God is the ultimate judge. He will provide justice where existentialism has no justice. So I have here the antithesis and the unbeliever. So unbelieving worldview existentialism and the antithesis is the Christian worldview. So I want to finish off and end this lecture with uh, one final screen. It says, these are four um, historically known seri serial killers. So you have um, starting on, on the left to right so it is Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, then Jeffrey Dahmer, and at the bottom is the son of Sam. Um, so these are f four uh, historical, historically known and popular serial killers of the last, you know, 50, 60 years. And, you know, the, the question I ask, according to existentialism, are these men bad? Well, if these men were acting authentically, were making choices to kill other people uh, based upon living authentically to who they are, then they were living in good faith. There's nothing wrong with what they did. So Jeffrey Dahmer killing and eating someone is no more is no better or worse than the person who tries to live out uh, love thy neighbor. There really is no difference. So I leave that there, and I'm going to leave one final one final slide to kind of humor us. Your eyes cocaine. Your eyes on marijuana and your eyes on existentialism. Ultimately, we want to put our eyes on Christ, fix our eyes on Christ. So I appreciate your time and hopefully this was beneficial to you. God bless.